Okay. So, uh, first speaker today is uh, Professor Anjun Sen, and he's from Jamia Millia Islamia University, and he'll be talking about cosmological tensions, signals for new physics beyond lambda CTM. Okay, thank you, uh, well, the organizer, for the invitation. So, uh, I'll be talking about these cosmological tensions, like uh, in recently that uh, these have been sort of there, and uh, there are some very interesting results that are coming re regarding this cosmological tension. So, uh, so what I will do actually, I first try to uh, describe these tensions that what it means. And then uh, having these tensions, I try to motivate that, uh, that whether this tension signals some failure of the lambda CDA model that we know now, it is one of the most successful model uh, for cosmology. And uh, what kind of new physics that one can expect uh, from this cosmological tension? I should say that in, in this talk, like I'll describe, I'll discuss few observational results which actually uh, point toward this cosmological tension. But I'll take those observational re results as it is uh, because most of those results, there are some there are some issues that there can be systematics, there can be statistical fluctuation and other that. Uh, people say that may not be what they are indicating. So I'll not go through that. I will take those results as it is, as it stands now. And taking those results, how one can see that, is there any, any signal for new physics beyond lambda CDM? Okay, so, okay, so just for the warm up, so I will assume that for this expanding universe is governed by this FRW uh, metric with, the gravity is determined the standard GR. And then we have for the background expansion, these two equations that we all know. One is the Friedman equation and another the Raichudur equation. One describes the velocity of the acceleration and another describes the, uh, the velocity of the expansion and another describes the acceleration of the expansion. And uh, the two parameter that is important is H naught and the Q naught. One is the expansion rate and another is the acceleration. The, the, the goal of all the cosmological expansion is, or the cosmological observation is basically to, uh, to find the A as a function of T, but we directly don't measure A as a function of T. We measure some proxies, like for scale factor, we measure this to the redshift, and for the time, we measure this to the distance, because we have a speed of light which is constant in all inner systems. Okay, so there are three numbers that I said. One is this expansion rate, one is the acceleration rate, and also one can have a curvature in the universe, special curvature. So that is also there, fine. And if I assume that the inflation is true, we can ignore the special curvature and assume the universe is flat, specially flat. And then this is this the Hubble expansion rate that we have over here. Uh, most of the time, and in this talk, I'll mostly concentrate with in the late time universe. And we can, uh, so this is the, the, the amount of the cold dark matter and baryon. We all together put it in omega m naught. And then we can ignore the radiation for the late time physics. And then we have any, any dark component that we have in the universe with an equation of step w, but which w I don't know at this moment, but that, that is actually the composition of the universe. And these are the density parameters. This is the equation of state. And if this, this, whatever the dark component is cosmological constant, this equation of state is minus one. And then we have this acceleration rate is given by this. And as you can see, if you have a flat, this omega lambda and omega m naught, they are actually related by one. So there are only two parameters over here, omega m naught and w. And if you have cosmological constant, then obviously w is minus one. So the only parameter that is over here is the omega m naught. And which is important, because if you just look at it, most of the late time physics, this 13 giga year, let's say I take redshift from 30 and then below, all the expand, all the cosmo, cosmology are actually dependent upon this thing, some form of this H parameter. And this H, this Hubble expansion, is actually has one single parameter, omega M naught and H naught. And most of the observable are actually related with H by H naught. So everything is now in the omega M naught. So it's, it's remarkable that there's only single parameter in the universe, which is omega M naught. Uh, which actually can describe the universe uh, for most of the part of its evolution, fine, which is important. And we'll see that there's some very interesting feature that is coming over here. Uh, another thing is that in the, all this description, we ask, it is assumed, 
or the structure is such that this omega m naught is a constant. It just comes to the uh, through the it is an integration constant. It comes to the integration of the conservation equation, the energy conservation equation. So it's an integration constant. It's constant throughout. So here also, I mean, all this description, this omega m naught is a constant. Um, we can see that, uh, and also it is less than one because this whole thing is actually one because of the flatness. And we'll see that there may be some indication that there may be some uh, some failure of either of these assumptions that whether omega m naught is constant or whether this omega m parameter is always less than equal to one. Okay, so that is some interesting thing that is coming up. Okay, around 1990s we have this h naught. So that time. The H naught is a huge error bar from 60 to 80, whatever you can have. We didn't know at that time the universe is accelerating, so omega a lambda was zero, and this so omega m naught is one, and q naught was omega m naught by two, given that omega m is positive, q naught is positive, so universe was decelerating. Fine. So that was the situation. Okay, coming to the part of universe, then this is the thing that we are interested in, that is a, uh, in the linear regime. Uh, this is the flux, the, uh, the perturbation in the matter sector. This is governed by this equation coming from the equation of continuity and Euler equation. So what we are interested in is not in the delta M, but what is called the growth factor, which is the F, uh, which is given by this. And for lambda CDM, again, we don't need to solve this equation. It, was, it can be shown that this F is actually very nicely represented by this omega M to the power six by A. Right? So again, here also, this growth factor is just depend upon omega. I mean, it's actually true because if you just write this expression and try to solve, this is the only parameter that goes into it is the omega. But you don't need to solve it. You can show that this peaking function is a, a very fantastic fit to this equation. The observable is basically most of the time is one is the f sigma, which is coming from the uh, red shift space distortion things. Uh, and there's another parameter called sigma, basically the matter in mean the amplitude of the matter fluctuation at h inverse, eight h inverse megaparsec scale. And this sigma jet actually can be written like this way. It's not very difficult. So the parameters here are basically sigma at present. And then this factor, but again, if we assume f to be this, I can calculate this factor in terms of omega. Okay, so again, the the the, the parameter that is involved in all these. Observable that is we can calculate from the from the part of universe, omega m and sigma it. Okay, sigma it at present, sigma it before. There's another observable which is actually S8 parameter. Uh, it is basically measure the amplitude of the cosmic shear from coming from the weak lensing, and this is also related to this one sigma it and omega m. Okay, and within the lambda CDM, w equal to minus one, the parameter that need to const constraint is basically these two parameters. Okay. This f sigma, sigma you can observe from other thing also, I also described that from cluster uh, number counts and other you can, f till now, but I think at some point you can also directly measure f like Euclid can measure f. Uh, okay, so now what are the observations? So around 1999, we know that from this supernova group, they, they showed that the universe is accelerating. And as you can see that they actually measure this mu, which is related to this DL H naught. And again, DL H naught is just related to H by H naught. And H by H naught is just depend upon omega, nothing else, if you assume the lambda C. Okay. And they, what they found is this omega M is actually around 0.3. And then there is a dark energy component, which is around 0.7. And if you put that thing, and then Q naught coming out to be negative, Universe is accelerating, fine. And then there are other measurement comes, there's W map, then baryon acoustic oscillation. You put everything together, you get a very small region over here. And it says that uh, there is a dark energy and the omega m is around 0.3. And then come 2018, the Planck result, the fantastic measurement of cosmic uh, micro background fluctuation. And as you can see, that the six parameter lambda CDM model, which is an excellent fit to this, this Planck data. And this six parameter lambda CDM model, we need this only these six parameters. And with these six parameters, we can actually have a very excellent fit to all those things, assuming that this is a lambda CDM model. And again, you can see that most of the parameters here are related 
these are all related to the early universe and uh, the parameter that is related in from z less than 30 is basically the omega m and then you can derive this omega m these are other derived parameters so these are the parameter that is there that i described till now for the late universe the omega m parameter the h naught parameter and the sigma m parameter. Okay. and there is no dark in there is no evidence that uh, we can go we need to go beyond any dark energy model beyond the lambda cdm okay because the lambda cdm model is such a fantastic fit to the length so the question is now so shall you then stop looking for any new physics beyond lambda cdm because we don't need lambda any anything beyond lambda cdm only thing that we need to concentrate is that we have to solve this cosmological constant problem because the dark energy whether it's lambda cdm or any other dark energy it sets the energy scale and that energy scale you cannot derive from any standard particle physics model so you need to uh, we need to know better that how we can have this very very tiny cosmological constant in the universe fine so that all it boils down to but now i described that what are this what are the problem with this lambda cdm that has been described from planck time itself in the planck paper itself and now till now okay the first thing that in the planck paper they are actually they measured or actually they discussed was that this tension that is they have with the Lyman alpha result, fine. So this is the baryon acoustic oscillation measurement from different different observational setup. And this is, that is what you get from the Bosch Lyman alpha. And this has a sort of 2.3, 2.4 sigma tension with what you get from the Planck lambda CDM. So it is a derived parameter from Planck lambda CDM. You derive that thing, and then you see that what is the tension with what you get directly from the Bosch Lyman. And if you look at the Planck paper, what they actually said that maybe that this result is due to some statistical fluctuation or some small systematic error. But it is not, if it is not true, because if it is not that there is no statistical fluctuation or this, this, this result holds true, then there, is a, there may be a signature of a new physics because they actually tried, because if you go to the Planck chains and then you can see that they have tried to solve this problem with different, at that time, what are the dark energy model that you have beyond lambda CDM. And they couldn't sort of get this result, right? No, this is from all those things, you're actually plotting this thing, right? The, the D measurement, right? So you can get the baryon acoustic oscillation, you get the distance, and you convert this distance to the what is called the co moving distance, some sort of combination of co moving distance and age, and you get this. The plank is this, this band, the base fit and the band, right? So if it is a plank, so the, the actually it is one, fine, and then you have the error bar over there. And then these are the results that you get from BO, fine. So they couldn't find any known model beyond lambda CDM, like some dark energy model with constant equation of state, with CPL, with modified gravity model, different, different things that they have. And they couldn't find this value, actually, okay. So this is the first thing, fine. And they very conveniently said that, okay, we are, not using this data anymore in our all our calculation and then we are going but because maybe there is some kind of statistical or some systematic errors up there okay now i will describe this more on later but just now we have the thing that as i said that the from planck assuming lambda cdm you get this h naught value and remember that this h naught value that we get from planck it's model dependent i will describe how we can get this thing in a few minutes but this is a model dependent, and this actually comes from lambda CDM only. Whereas the shoes measurement that we have, that is more or less model independent. You don't need to assume any cosmological model. And these two measurements are now uh, around the five sigma tension per part. Right? So if you have a tension, because as because this is the so maybe there is some system that is going over here that we don't know. That can be the possible possibility. But if it is not that. In the cosmological model side, if you have some issue, the issue needs to be solved over here because this is mostly model independent. So you need to have some model in the cosmology so that the Planck data gives you a value which is consistent with this, with that model, fine. So that is the way maybe you can solve this problem. But they are here also, I mean, I need to convey this message, but because you can see that this measurement depends upon physics beyond early universe. And this measurement depends on the astrophysics of stars at the very late time, fine. And still these measurements, and they're separated by around 13, 
14 giga years, fine, because this is around redshift thousand, few minutes old. This is around present redshift, redshift around 0 0.01, 0 0.02. So they are two separated by 13, means a huge age of the universe. Still, they are in agreement within the 10%, which is, which is fantastic, fine. It actually says that our accuracies, our measurement accuracies are very well, and our, our knowledge about standard cosmology or our astrophysics is very well. So that still means completely two different set of observations with two different set of physics are within the agreement within the 10%, which is the base base. So what, you, what they do is that, yeah, so the, they, see the, they, they define the tensions like that, that you do the convolution and then you have the base fit from A minus base fit of B divided by sigma A square plus sigma B square. So this is the tension that we define. Okay, so. Yeah, so because he's normalized actually. So means you can you can put in without normalizations and then these are means like the same, but you just put the normalization because then it becomes very high because your error bar is error bar is small. Okay. The next is the SI tension that I described the SI parameter. Again, from Planck, because Planck, as I said, the derived parameters, you can derive the sigma parameter, you derive the omega m naught parameter, you put all those things over here, and then we can derive this SI parameter within the Planck, assuming that this is a lambda CDM, you get this value. But if you directly measurement this SI parameter from weak lensing, like kids or any other, like DES or other, this is roughly around this value. And these two things are kind of three to four sigma tension. And they are all these measurements. So this is the measurement that comes from the early universe. And these are the measurements coming from all the late universe. And all the late universe measurements are mostly consistent within this value. And this is the early universe measurement coming from Planck. And these are actually around having a three sigma tension. There's another important tension that is the sigma tension. This is a very interesting paper that came recently. So what they have found that when you use this number count of low redshift galaxies and using the kunal jeldovich effect with SPT, they got this sigmoid like this because this cluster number count depends on the sigmoid parameter and they got this value. Right? And these are the values where these, all these clusters are around, let's say, between 0 0.3, 0 0.4 to 1, 1.1. 1 .1. Whereas they also measure this exactly the same sigmoid from uh, the Lyman alpha spectra using this mic or this, and they got this value of sigma parameter. These are measurement over redshift two and beyond. Right? And as you can see that these are roughly around 3.3 sigma tension. They, they actually have a very nice discussion that what actually can be the source of the tension, but it seems that, I mean, they actually argue that they have taken most of the systematics and other thing in control, but if still there are something, it is very difficult to actually reconcile this 3.3 sigma tension. So there are maybe something, again, all these are basically assuming the lambda CDM model. So there are maybe something that we need to go beyond lambda CDM. Again, you can see that the tension is basically coming from the, this is a low shield measurement, this is a high shield measurement. Keep this in mind because I will show uh, these exactly same results coming from some other observations, right? The exactly the same kind of measurement. And as you can see, these are the two light loops over here, and they are around 3.6. The last result is basically coming from the JWST. It's very interesting result. Uh, so what they found that they found that this is around redshift 10, 9, 10. So they found that uh, very massive galaxies in this redshift very dense massive stars, or mass, sorry, dense massive galaxies in this redshift. And that cannot be explained given that at this redshift, if you assume that the lambda CDM is a true model, okay? So what they assume then that let's say I have a dark energy model with this kind of CPL where you put the equation of state at present minus one, and then you have some variation over that. This is the lambda CDM where WA equal to zero. So this is the lambda CDM. And these are the model which can be described by a not lambda CDM, but kind of a non-phantom model. This is a kind of a phantom model. 
And as you can see that this point, they have now a couple of other points. Uh, these are around two, two, three sigma intensions. Uh, so again, okay. So if you see, if you, with time in future, when if these results holds true, you have more measurements. It seems that you have more massive galaxy, or in that sense, you have more. Maybe your nonlinear structure formation starts earlier than what you predict from the lambda CDN, or also around that redshift, you have more mass in the universe than what is predicted by the lambda. Right? Because you have more massive galaxy. And this is important that if this is true, it seems that there are the nonlinear structures earlier, uh, started earlier. It seems that there is more mass in the universe than what is predicted by the lambda CDN. Okay? And this, this very fact uh, I will use later, right? what it actually can give. Okay, good. So these are the tensions that there are other tensions. People have talked about what is called the curvature tension, there are lensing tension from the CMB. But I will not describe, maybe later if someone is interested, we can discuss. But these are the mostly the tension that is there. And rest of the talk, I'll, just, I'll just go through depending upon this tension. Now, what happens if we bin the Pantheon plus data? So now we have the Pantheon data, which is around 1900 data. So what happens, because given the fact that always we have seen that there is a measurement, there is an issue with the early universe measurement or early is low redshift measurement and high redshift measurement, fine. So what happens, let's say I just, been the Pantheon data in a sense, what had been done over here, let's say when I said jet speed is 0.3. So if you look at the Pantheon plus data, there's a Pantheon plus data, and then there's a calibration data, which is coming from the CFI, fine. So that CFI data is around 200 something, 77, sorry, 77 CFI data. And then the rest are the Pantheon plus data. So when I said it is 0.3, I'm saying that I'm taking the supernova data from 0.3 and beyond. When I say it is 0.4, I'm saying the supernova data 0.4 and beyond, but my 77 CFID calibration data is always there because I am calibrating all these supernovas to the CFID data, okay? So this has been done over here. This patch is when you take the whole Pantheon data, this patch, okay? And then these are the points when you take this peak, like 0.3 and all the high redshift data is this measurement, 0.4 high redshift data, this measurement, and that's true. Obviously, as you go to the higher redshift, you have very less supernova data, so your error bar goes higher. What you found is very interesting that this H0 parameter, which is usually the constant, and when you bin the data and you go to taking the measurement from the higher redshift, as you can see, that this H0 measurement actually varies. You have H0 measurement over here, which is 75 or something, but as you go to the higher redshift, the value of the H0, obviously the error bars are big, but still the value of the H0 falls. At the same time, if you do the same, because you have the H0 and omega m, if you do the same thing, you measure the omega m from defined, defined this redshift bin, your omega m is actually evolved. And as you go to the higher redshift, omega m goes, there's a tendency that omega m goes beyond one. Okay, so omega m not only goes higher value, the omega m actually goes to value which is beyond one. Remember that most of the time, what actually H depends upon omega rho m, which is omega m into h square, fine. So that is the thing that is there in the h. So it is, it is okay, it means it is quite understandable that if, because rho m remains the same, so if h not falls, the omega m actually goes up, right? So this is to make the rho, rho m actually the same. But this is the tendency that we have, right? These are all two sigma, yeah. Now, what can be done? Now, if your omega m goes beyond one, let's say, if this is true, then as one thing you can, this is always clear that there is a higher omega m in the high rate, fine. Secondly, as because your total thing is one, if omega m goes beyond one, then there is a tendency that, that the corresponding omega lambda become negative, fine, because, because omega m plus omega lambda is always one. So there's a hint, if this is true, I don't know, but we just go through this binning data, we get these results, and if it is true, then there's a hint that there's a high redshift. There is some contribution over there in the universe which has some small negative value, okay. Or what I said is omega mz, we said that this is a normal matter from conservation equation is goes like one plus z cube. Maybe this is not true, okay. So omega m not, because all these things is assuming lambda CDM. So maybe the omega m, no, omega m does not scale like one plus z cube. There's some defined scaling. This may happen from some interacting dark energy or some any other new physics, I don't know, okay. 
What happens when you do the same thing? Why is it getting it? Okay, what happens if you do the same thing for the growth data that I said, the F sigma data that we have from the RSD? Currently, we have from different, different measurement, we have around 66 data. So what happens to that? What happens if we bin this data? Like the same binning that I said, like the Z minimum is like, this is basically Z minimum is zero. That means you take the, all the data. And this is what happens when you take the Z minimum 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3 and all. So you are taking 0 0.1 and beyond, 0 0.2 and beyond, 0 0.3 and beyond, something like that. You can see that, this, and this is the patch that you get from Planck. This is the patch that you get from kids. And this is the Planck that you get from D. What do you actually see? Okay. One thing we should say that this F sigma data is not very accurate. So they have the large error bar. So for that, we actually put a heart prior for the omega M naught, heart Gaussian prior. This is coming from the Planck band. So in a sense, when you put, because ultimately, as, you, as I discussed, that sigma S8 has the sigma H and omega M naught. So you are putting heart prior on this omega M basically from Planck bio means that you are actually putting the information that you are getting from Planck or bio into this measurement. Fine. What you actually get this sigma S8 parameter is actually also evolved. It goes from a small value go to a very high value. And as you know that I said this S8 depends upon sigma it and omega m. If we have a hard prior on omega m, your sigma it also evolves in that sense that if you have this. And this is also this is the same thing that has been done, as it been said that I said previously that the paper, that what I said that we have this sigma that the low rate shift. We have a sigma it's small in the high rate shift, the sigma is very high, fine. The same result is there in means there in built in the growth data itself. Okay. This is just to look at in a defined way. Let's say I divide the data between rate shift 0.7. And so we get you take the data smaller than 0.7 or higher than 0 0.7, or rate shift greater than 1.1 or smaller than 1.1. You see that this trend actually remains there. You have a very hard prior on omega n. But when you have sigma it and S8, these things actually separate up. It's the same. Because these S8 and sigma it are kind of correlated. Okay. So this is the same result. So this is a paper that we put very recently. So this is the same result that we get that what people got from weak lensing and cluster number count from low rate shift and high rate shift. Okay. So given all those things, I just now try to motivate the fact that what sort of model that you can have very quickly. So just go to the how the CME measures the H0. So the CME measures the H0 in a derived parameter. So this is a three-step process. First is that we have the sound horizon, which is the distance the photon baryon plasma moves still from beginning to the decoupling. And it depends on this integration, and it depends the H z till the decoupling, and also the omega b and omega r around that time. So there is no late time information over here. Fine. Then we know that we can infer this angular scale from the CMB peak equation, which is a very, very accurately measurement measured quantity. So from the peak separation, we can get this sigma theta. And then I don't know why it is coming over here. Then we have this angular diameter distance that we measure to this acoustic scale, uh, which is basically RS. Oh, sorry, which is basically RS by theta. Okay. And in this angular diameter distance, we have to integrate this HZ from zero to Z star. And here actually the late time information comes in because the HZ here you are integrating from zero to Z star. So you have to assume a model over here and usually we assume the lambda CL. So this RS we know, theta we know, DI is a constant RS by theta. Then you, may, you, you assume a model like lambda CDM, it depends upon H naught and then from there you get the H naught, okay? So the plan get the H naught value, assume the lambda CDM just to these things. Okay, if you take a defined model than lambda CDM, you get a defined HZ, and then your H naught can be different. Fine. So how you can now reconcile this Planck H naught and the shoes H naught? Fine. So let's have these two plot. I just plotted. Forget about the green curve. I plotted the yellow and blue. Same lambda CDM. Initially they have the same at redshift thousand, whatever the Planck gives. But one has H naught 73 and one has H naught 67. So these are the two behavior that you can get, fine. So to go from blue to yellow, two things can happen. 
that in the early universe, you do some something so that the early universe, the expansion rate increases. You go from this curve to this curve, and then you follow. Okay, so that is one thing. The other thing is that in the blue curve, you follow, and then there are maybe some interesting physics in the late universe so that you can suddenly jump from the blue curve to the blue curve, yellow curve. So these two things you can have. You can have fine. Now, what can be the solution? Let's say I fix, so this is the late time dark energy information that goes through it. Assume that the omega m is standard going like one plus z cube. So whatever the dark energy information is in fz, dz is now this, this dA parameter is this. So if you say that I don't have any late time physics change, so your ej remains the same, okay? So this, this part remains the same. So you need to increase h naught. So your dA actually falls. So if the dA falls, so this increases. So these are RA, RA has to also decrease at the same way. So that is the thing I do, do, do though, that your RS in the early time has to decrease. And that means your HZ in the early time has to increase. That means you need to have a more expansion in the early time so that your RS decreases and correspondingly you go from here to here, you just follow this. So H not increases, DA decreases, RS decreases, so the pre recombination HZ increases. Right? So that is one way you solve this problem. And that is exactly what has been done, which is this paper by Vivian Polin, Mark Kaminkowski, and other, which is called the early dark energy solution, is one of the most important solutions that people talk about. So what they have done, they said that, okay, I have some dissipative action fluid, which is there before the pre-recombination for a small time, it dominates. So it actually, so this is the normal cosmological constant that we have, but due to this action that we have, it some dominance the early time, it behaves like a cosmological constant. So there is a peak over here, so it suddenly gives a kick in the early time so that your expansion rate increases. And then due to this, its interaction with the radiation, it decays to the radiation. So it quickly, then it quickly decays so that your recombination and after all physics is remains intact, right? Okay, so much? Okay, fine. So, so this is a solution. This is a heavily fine-tuned solution uh, because you need to do everything so that everything happens in perfect time and all those things. But this is a solution. And people have talked about different, different modification of these solutions so that you can solve this problem. The other way is that that you put your you put your uh, early universe physics intact, so your RS remains same, your DA remains same. Then whatever you have to do is that because DA remains same means the H naught increases means this in, this integration has to increase. So if I talk this integration AZ, this AZ has to increase proportionately with H naught. And what is this AZ? AZ is this. This, this parameter that you have, this integration, where this EZ has this information for the dark energy, and it is not very difficult to show that to increase this EZ, you have to go to a phantom kind of dark energy equation. So this has to be done. What happens? So this is strange that if you do the late time physics, you have to have a phantom kind of equation of state. And if you have to have this 10% increase, your phantom equation of state has to be very, very phantom, and that can actually can spoil your other measure. So that people say that your late time physics or late time uh, modification may not be viable. But what happens that if I add within this phantom plus phantom thing with a small cosmological, with a cosmological, extra cosmological constant, product, it is nothing just like if you have a scalar field is giving your, your dark energy and in the scalar field, uh, the minimum is actually negative, fine. So you have a small cosmological constant add to the scalar field. It doesn't change your scalar field evolution, but it adds to some, uh, extra component to the to the energy component. What I showed over here is that actually, I have not much of time. Actually, one can show that this AJ parameter can be increased due to if this omega m lambda is actually negative. So if you have a phantom, your omega, this AJ increases that I showed. But if you have a small negative value over here, you can have a less phantom but you can have the same increase of edge. So whatever the phantomness or you need, you can compensate by a small negative cosmological constant in your, in your, in your data. So you can, you can just play away with that. So that we did. So let's say that whether this is true, because if I take this kind of model, what is the constant on this? In, don't assume that this is a positive or negative. Assume that this is, has some value, including zero. So what we have? So we do all those things. We just take the CMB data, the full plank, the BO, the supernova shoes. At that time, the C field calibration was not there. We take the two dark energy, this equation of state. Okay, one is just a constant and one is CPL. 
And to our surprise, what we got, let's say you have this thing, CMB BO, fine. We feed this model. What we got is that omega lambda actually coming out to be negative, the base fit. You get a value of H naught, which is actually this, which is within 2.2 sigma uh, with, the, with the shoes results, not five sigma. And you get a very, very huge improvement in your chi-square and your log of eject, fine. Which is interesting. Then we, we use this thing, so because now your CMB bio measurement of H naught is consistent within two sigma with the shoes measurement. So we can add the shoes measurement now. And then we showed that that everything is fine. We have a very good improvement from the, from the lambda CDM result. Right? These are the likelihood plots. Okay, these are the likelihood plots. And as you can see, this is the lambda CDM and this is our thing with the small negative cosmological constant. You get a negative cosmological constant within the two sigma, which is, which is consistent. Now, as you can see that this is also consistent with the result that I showed earlier, that omega m can go beyond one. So it can give you a, a some component can give a some component hint, which is some negative value. It is also consistent with the fact that if it is negative, the omega lambda is negative. The early time, the omega m has to be higher. And that can also, we are doing that calculation that and also can help to reconcile with the JWST results. Because we have a greater omega, you have a greater mass over there. Not only that, you have a higher, means we have a more deeper gravitational potential. And unlike positive cosmological constant, the negative cosmological constant also gives a positive gravitational potential. So you have an extra gravitational potential there. It can help to reconcile the JWST thing. We are doing, hopefully, very quickly, very soon we have the result. And what we said is this, this dark energy actually has this phantom behavior and then quickly settles in the early time, it just settles to a small negative cosmological constant. So this was this lab with lambda CDM. So this is the shoes measurement. This was the CMB value with lambda CDM. But now we have this measurement that we have uh, with the small negative cosmological constant, which is now within the 2.2. So I just, because I can, I mean, we can discuss later there, other things that we showed that this sort of train can go through. I mean, this train actually continues. We have other models also. And that also is consistent that there's some sort of a small negative value sitting over there. Over and above a dark energy constant. Okay, so that is my conclusion. Uh, and it seems that the lambda CDM has some problem, not only from Hubble tension, but the other tensions. And there are small, small things that you look at this data. There's some very interesting observation that comes there. And definitely if those observations hold true in future, then we need some new physics. And as, I, as this conference actually says that the less travel path in, the, in cosmology is a very less travel path that we have a, some negative cosmological constant in the universe. Always we talk about positive cosmological constant. So um, that may be some possibility. And interestingly, when we are writing this paper, I mean, our negative, actually after we wrote this paper, we came out of this paper by these people, all these string theory people, we, I don't know that much. But what their conclusion is that they try to build a, for a model for positive cosmological constant with the value that we need. What they found that they get the value of the cosmological constant right, but they get the value which is negative. Right? Actually, we need exactly this kind of value with the negative, right? And they said that, okay, this is, not a, this is not a model for the present cosmology or present universe because the cosmological constant is negative. So we need to do more things so that we can uplift this negative cosmological constant term to positive cosmological constant. But interestingly, the value they got and the sign they got is also consistent what sort of things that we, we, are, we are getting from our, from our calculation. Uh, thank you, Anjan, for a nice talk. We can take one or two quick questions. I saw so Subhinoy first. No, actually, that is a paper by Dragan Hattara that it came. I, I didn't have time to discuss because if you if you have more, more clustering, sigma is a normalization, right? 
sigmoid at present, fine. And it is the integration from that part to that part, fine. So if you have a more clustering in the thumb part, like in H0, it's same thing is happening. When you calculate the distance, so you are actually measuring the distance from, let's say, from CMB 1000 to today, fine. You, and that distance is same, fine. At any point, if you have a less, means if you have something like Lyman alpha that is gave, something less, you have to compensate that thing with something high, fine. And that's why, I mean, like, you have some negative value over here, it has con, con, I mean, con, kind of compensated by a high H0 value at present, fine. In the sigmoid also, it is the, happening the same because you have to integrate, fine. And that is described in this uh, Dragon paper, that you have this thing, that you have a more clustering at some point, but when you do the normalization, you have to do the, the integration from all these things. So the sigmoid value at present become, it is not the sigmoid at that red sheet, it's the sigmoid at present, so it actually goes down. So uh, I brought this up yesterday, and I think we can carry this forward to today's discussion. Uh, it is, uh, I think, useful not to frame the H0 tension as early time versus late time. No, 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 I agree. Yeah, because, you know, uh, you, you're probably aware there are papers which analyze the full shape of the boss uh, uh, power spectrum, and they can actually get H0 values at redshift of about 0.5, without using a CMB prior, and their H0 is consistent with Planck. So it seems to be more of a sound horizon versus uh, I agree. Um, uh, you know, local distance ladder measurement. Uh, so my first question is, if, do you take that into account in your phantom dark? Yeah, yeah. you can see that. If I go, let's say our table. Yeah. So you see that your sound horizon is exactly the same that you get from the CMB view. What is actually people are doing when they, they, because you are exactly right, because if you do the BAO, you have this RD into H0, fine? So if your H0 goes up, RD goes down, fine? Now, we have another paper that we, we discussed this thing elaborately. What actually is happening when you calculate all those things, you are assuming that your H has a kind of a monomial, it, means it, it doesn't change, fine? It is a, in, in a decreasing function or whatever, fine? Within that, this is true. But if we have where the H0 changes, means like goes down and means the slope of the H0 changes, it has some oscillation or whatever, this thing actually, then you don't have that problem with the sound rise. And other thing maybe we can do with the discussion, the Esposito paper, I didn't know of it, but it was very interesting that they actually, their AS yeah. is actually consistent with Planck. Exactly. Uh, exactly. It's the NS, which is... Oh, NS is a little bit high. Yeah. Uh, we, I have not quoted because recently we did with the Pantheon Plus and the CFIT calibration, the same thing. Uh, the chains now complete, and we saw that the NS also here coming out to be little high, 0.98 or something. Because NS and H0 also has a correlation. So, okay, yeah. So you uh, saw here the chi-square improvement, in chi improvement in chi-square. So I doubt that most of the improvement is coming from the H0. If you split the contribution of chi-square for this experiment, it is spoiling the, uh, you see the CMB alone. So, no, it, okay. With the CMB alone, as soon as you go beyond lambda CDN, you cannot, uh, you cannot constant any other parameter because the CMB information is not that much. Because at the end of the day, when you have any dark energy, most of the contribution in CMB, the dark energy information comes from this angular diameter distance that you have. There are some other thing which is at the very low L or very large scale where, but that is due to the cosmic variance, you don't have those effects. I mean, you cannot constrain that. But we are trying to improve the, I mean, the tension is within the CMB data. You are Yeah, so, but you have to put the BO. Otherwise, you cannot the, I mean, With CMB plus BO, because if you, if you don't put BO, you cannot constrain anything dark energy model beyond lambda CDO. You can't. There is no, in, not enough information in CMB that you can constrain anything beyond lambda CDO. So you have to put either CMB with BO or CMB with supernova, because around that redshift, you have to put that information so that you can connect this. To. Otherwise, uh, any dark energy information, it is very difficult. To use. But okay, when you combine the BO as well, then the tension is not really moved. It is 69.6. Yeah, yeah. But you, you see that exactly that is true because you can say that, okay, fine. I have an extra parameter. So it's going to from 67 to 69, but your error bar is high. So means your error bar actually goes. So now you are making this thing that is consistent. But when you do actually the evidence calculation, this thing is taken care of. The extra parameter thing is taken care of. So you're, but it shows that the evidence is also very high in that sense. Yeah. 
So, uh, since we are running slightly short of time, if you don't mind, shall we defer some of the questions to the discussion session? Yeah. Huh? Good. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs>